No? Yeah, good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure for me to uh, kick off this uh, session on the coronary microcirculation. And we have a great, great panel and a great session prepared for you. So I'm just uh, going to introduce the, the team that we have, and I'm going to start with my left. I have the pleasure to have uh, Divaca Pereira as co-moderator. Then we have Sergio Batista, that's going to present one fantastic case. Nils Van Royen is going to also be one of our speakers. And we have also Dia Milasnovic as also presenting a session. Uh, Divaka, I think uh, we should uh, then invite uh, all the people to participate. Yes. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming for probably your last session of the day. There may be more that you're going to. Uh, let's make this as interactive as possible. There are, there are mics uh, around. And also, don't forget that, that we have a chat master. So please enter any questions or, or comments that, that you have. Um, so let's get rolling. Carlos. Excellent. Thank you very much. So my name is Carlos Colette, and the n title of the session is Coronary Microvascular Dysfunction in Case Examples. It's going to be a very practical uh, uh, session. Mm -hmm. And it's said invisible, measurable, and treatable. And I really like the title that AeroPCR has selected for today. These are my disclosures. So many of us are very familiar with epicardial coronary artery disease, and we might be also familiar with the indexes addressing both the severity and the distribution of epicardial disease, uh, the FFR and the PPG. But the focus of tonight is actually going to the microcirculation that represents almost more than 90% of the, of, the, of the vasculature. And we're going to focus on two indexes that are easily derived from bolus thermodilution that are CFR and IMR. So the session, the session objectives are, one, to learn how to perform a step-by-step -step approach to assess the coronary microcirculation in the cat lab, to discuss the clinical presentation, treatment, and follow-up of patients with CMD, and to understand how to use both CFR and IMR to diagnose a patient with INOCA. With further ado, I think we can proceed with the session. Thank you, Carlos. So may I, may I invite Sergio to um, start us off with a case um, uh, of an Inoka patient. Thank you, Sergio. Oh, thank you, Divaka. Can I, can I have the slides? So my role is to, to present you the first case. Uh, it's, uh, as you will see, a microvascular disease case, uh, which we will be able to discuss uh, in the following presentations with some uh, instructions on how to do it step by step. This is still... No, I think it's, it's just being loaded in. It's being loaded. It, it was being loaded, yeah. Okay, it's here. Okay. So these are my disclosures concerning this presentation. And the first case is about a 55, 55 years old female with a past medical history of diabetes and high cholesterol, which was not treated. She was on metformin with citaclepin and also dapagliflozin. And she went to her general practitioner with complaints of chest pain appearing with the exercise, which was classified as class 2-3. So the GP asked for an ECG, which was the one you are seeing now, basically normal, and also an echo, which was also normal. So the GP asked for a myocardial perfusion scan, which you can see here. I'm sorry for the quality of the image, but you can clearly see there is ischemia in the apex in the interior wall. And with this in mind, the GP started some nitrates and referred the patient to the cardiology clinic. And so we saw this patient. Uh, at, the, at the time we saw her, she still had complaints. Uh, she had no significant improvement in her angina complaints. And the nitrates were being poorly tolerated. Uh, on physical examination, she had a blood pressure of 132 over, thank you, over 86 and a heart rate of 78, and it was otherwise unremarkable. And so it was proposed to do a coronary angiography to this patient with complaints and with ischemia on a perfusion scan. So this is her coronary angiography, and as you can see, it's normal, so absolutely no disease, both in the left and in the right coronary arteries. So at this point, having a patient with chest pain, suggesting angina, and with a positive 
ischemia tests, we decided to evaluate the microvascular circulation, so a pressure wire was advanced, and we measured IMR and CFR, so you, you can see the final measurements. Uh, in blue, you can see the thermodilation curves at rest, and then in orange, the thermodilation curves after hyperemia with adenosine. And the results we got are this one here, so 1.1 of CFR and 31 of IMR. And as you know, uh, the thresholds for these two measurements are the ones I'm showing you here. So any value of IMR above 25 is considered to be high, and CFR is considered to be normal when it's higher than 2. So this patient clearly had a low CFR and an high IMR. We then did the provocation test with acetylcholine, which was normal, so no changes both in the constriction of the arteries or in the ECG, and no pain induced by the test. So looking at the different presentations that uh, uh, non-obsessive microvascular non disease can have, we have basically these two uh, different entities, vasospasm, vasospasm on, on one side and microvascular disease uh, on the other. We can have both, as we will see in the next case. But in this case, clearly what we had was microvascular dysfunction with uh, normal coronary arteries, low uh, CFR, high IMR, and negative uh, uh, vasospasm test. And in these cases, what the evidence we now have suggests is, is that the patient can improve with beta blockers, with uh, uh, statins and ACE inhibitors, and also with lifestyle changes. And that's what that was exactly what we did. So patients started by Zoprolol, atorvastatin, and ramipril. And it was proposed an, an exercise plan of one hour of moderate intensity exercise three times a week. So patient was uh, observed again six months after, and she improved in, in her angina complaints. It was now class one. Blood pressure and heart rate were normal. And this is the, the first case we have for discussion. Sergio, thank you very much. That was a, a fantastic case, and I'm pretty sure it's going to trigger a lot of discussion. And please feel free to uh, come to the microphone or po post your question on the chat. And we'll be happy to answer that. So I am uh, I'm curious to hear from you. This is a patient that is a typical patient, at least in my cat, uh, referred with typical symptoms. It's a lady with a positive test for ischemia, non-invasive test, and come to the cat lab and have normal coronary arteries, completely normal. In your CAT lab, the decision to uh, perform measurements of microvascular dysfunction is, is taken at the same moment of the, of the catheterization, or how is your plan in your CAT lab to assess the CFR and IMR as you did in this case? Yes, ideally, we, we try to do it in the same procedure. When you have information, like in this case, because you already knew she had ischemia and the, and the complaints were very typical, so why wait? Why not perform it right away? Obviously, this is changing because, as you know, more and more patients are arriving to the cath lab only with a CT scan, so without an ischemia test. And that changes everything. So I think in those cases, you need to be aware of the complaints. Are they typical or are they not typical? Um, if you have some mild disease, maybe you need to do FFR. And if you are doing FFR, you should do IMR, obviously, in the same procedure. But in some cases, I admit, if you don't have any information, you will need to, you know, discharge the patient and do a non-invasive ischemia test in some cases. It will really depend on how typical are the complaints, how likely for you is that the disease is a microvascular disease, but I would obviously always prefer to do it in the same procedure as you do in the first procedure. Yeah, I think the approach of, of doing an ad hoc CFR and IMR, I think it's the way to go. The patient's on the table. These measurements take about five, six minutes to be performed in the cat lab. And what we need to, to also understand is that the patient cannot go out of the cat lab without a diagnosis. The patient had ischemia, the patient is symptomatic, comes to the cat lab, the picardial is normal. Okay, we have to move forward to the microcirculation. Divaka, Sergio touched upon a point that is quite interesting today, that is the fact that CT is being used more and more as a first-line test to the, in patients with suspected coronary artery disease. And let's imagine, Sergio, that the physician that saw this patient the first time had requested a CT. The CT will come normal, Divaka. And I'm asking you because you, you come from the UK and you are the pioneers on proposing CT for, for all patients uh, with suspected coronary artery disease. How are you handling these situations where you have typical complaints, normal epicardial vessels? What happens in, in your practice? Yeah, interesting question. So when CT was first introduced, it was used as a rule-out test. And you only requested one if you thought the symptoms were atypical and this patient didn't have ischemia. 
Now, that's become the first line for everyone, including your patients with typical symptoms. So we, we have a bit of a problem in, to, in the system in that those patients may get dismissed uh, and discharged. If they have some plaque disease, they might get a statin, but that's about it. So system-wide, it's, it's an issue to try and capture these patients who still have an unexplained set of symptoms. Um, and if we do get referrals as interventional cardiologists, then it's a one-stop procedure to, to get the, the, the whole answer. Uh, microvascular function testing and epicardial vasomotor testing. I think uh, I'll tell you my experience, uh, Sergio. So uh, um, above all these uh, techniques where clinicians, uh, if the patient has really typical symptoms and there is a proof of ischemia, I think there is no doubt that something is happening in the coronary microcirculation. What we do in, in my practice in ALS is that we take these patients with a normal CT and we have the, let's say, the microvascular assessment with acetylcholine already planned. Uh, Niels, how is that working in, in, in your practice, the, the, the impact of the CT on the patient selection for microvascular assessment? Yes, very good question. Um, we are actually a, a tertiary referral center for this, so we have uh, patients from all over the country, and the, 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 the benefit of that is that we, well, we have a very enriched population, so most of these patients have had many non-invasive testings already, also invasive testing. Um, but with, if that is uh, not the case, uh, then normally we ask actually for a CT because it really uh, helps you in planning also of your procedures. Um, and uh, in, in that respect, you can directly uh, put those patients uh, in your cat lab scheme for a complete uh, coronary function testing also. And the other um, uh, advantage of that approach is that you don't, because if you perform the normal uh, coronary angiogram first, then you also have to give all the vasoactive medications like nitroglycerin, which might um, interfere with your coronary function test afterwards. So if there is no uh, non-infestive testing available, then normally we request for a coronary CT first. Sergio, uh, I think that this case was a clear-cut ischemia case, but... Ah, sorry. Sorry, There's a question from the audience. A lady. Thank you very much. Uh, Yolanda Apperman from Amsterdam UMC. Uh, thank you for the case. Um, and I think this is an example of patients we meet in a cat lab. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, um, what, what do you think the mechanism is uh, related to the improvement of her complaints um, because uh, my experience is uh, that it's very difficult to treat those patients with a low CFR and did you perform uh, uh, an ischemia test let's say after about six months to see if there were differences? So th thank you for your questions. The first one is very hard to, to answer, so we really don't know. There are probably several mechanisms, different mechanisms in different patients. They are not all the same. There is a wide range of patients included in this uh, microvascular dysfunction diagnosis. What we know from the evidence is that in, in, in some cases, like this one in which CFR is low and IMR is high, uh, beta blocker seems to be better than for instance, calcium antagonists. And, but sometimes you just need to try and see how it goes. Uh, concerning the second question, no, we didn't because the patient uh, is, is better, so she, she has improved, so usually we don't go for further testing when there are no complaints. Okay, thank you. Good. Just one, one last question, Sergio. Who in your, in your CAT lab is test for microvascular dysfunction? This is a classical case, ischemia, non-obstructive coronary artery disease, who? Where are the patients that you consider ad hoc to measure CFR and IMR in your practice? So uh, patients with uh, either mild disease or no disease at all, which have complaints and do, that do have some ischemia documentation, and that may be uh, having symptoms, and preferably with uh, at least one ischemia test, and that may be just you know, a treadmill test positive for ischemia with pain. Great. Thank you very much, Sergio. Thank you. So we've heard about how to interpret the results or you know, how we might use it to guide management, but let's spend the next few minutes discussing exactly how to make those measurements uh, and how to make them accurately. So Carlos, uh, please enlighten us. Thank you, Diwaka. And this is meant to be a step-by-step -step tutorial, and uh, I have to say that we record this video and we post it in, uh, in YouTube 
And before I entered the room, I got a colleague to hold my hand and said, I learned how to do this with your video on YouTube. And I said, that's fantastic. That's exactly the point of doing this type of educational tutorials. Uh, so this is meant to do exactly that. This is step by step, and this is how, how we do it. In, in ALS, again, my conflicts of interest. And the three things that you need to uh, start assessing the coronary microcirculation is one, the pressure wire X from Abbott that has, in addition to the pressure sensor, a temperature sensor at the tip of the wire or at the transition of the radio peg marker and in the shaft. You need the Coroventis console that is going to sense the changes in temperature, and you need a hyperemic agent. Classically, we have used IV adenosine, and this is what is used still most commonly in some uh, labs. Uh, the case is going to be done by intra intravenous adenosine, but now we have shift to papaverin that makes also things very simple. We're going to see a video of uh, how easy are these measures performed, these measurements performing the cat lab. So let's play it. I'm here uh, with uh, <coughs> Professor Bernardo Bruni. Uh, my name is Carlos Colette. We are doing uh, now a case that will be instrumental to see how to assess the microcirculation. So we will proceed then with the measurements of the microcirculation related mainly to CFR and IMR, which are based on bolus thermodilution. So to start doing these measurements, the wire has been already placed in the distal segment of the coronary. Now we're going to set our manifold to perform this uh, uh, bolus injection. So I'm going to take my contrast out and I'm going to put a 3cc needle, which is the one that we're going to use for the thermodilution measurements. And I'm going to put this at the end of my manifold. And I'm going to be sure, of course, that we don't have any bubbles in the system. Okay, now it's ready. So I'm going to flush a bit to be sure that we are bubbles free. And then we are ready, theoretically, to start the bolus dilution measure. So to start this, we're going to perform CFR. That means that we're going to start with resting injections to calculate the resting mean transit time. And I will go to the Coroventis screen, click on top of the function of FFR, and go to CFR IMR. Please go there. And this is how the screen of the CFR IMR looks like. Before I perform my first injection, I'm going to ask to zero the temperature. In other words, to perform an equalization of the temperatures between the shaft and the sensor. That is performed by clicking on the zero temp button. And I'm looking at the temperature signal that should be zero. Is 0, 0.00. That is, that is uh, good for me. So we are ready to start the CFR measurements. So we can click on start and look at the screen of the Coroventis now. I perform the first injection with a brisk injection of saline. You'll see there on the screen a very nice thermodilution curve, which is in the blue line. I'm going to inject again. And you see I got more or less the same morphology with a mean transit, with a transit time of 29 and, 30, and 31. And this is my last uh, injections. And you will see here that the last uh, mean transit time in rest is exactly the same as the first value, which is 0 0.30. The patient is now in hyperemia. The FFR of this vessel is 0 0.77. So we're going to start now doing the bolus thermodilution injections during hyperemia. Uh, every time we do two uh, sham injections, just to be sure that we have fresh saline uh, in the line, and then we are ready to start. So one of the things that we have to always check is that the catheter is in a good position. Bernard is taking care that the catheter is actually uh, looking uh, inside the vessel to have good curve. And we are sure that the catheter is well placed and that we have fresh saline, we're ready to start. So we click on induce hyperemia one time, and then we start again with the same uh, type of injections, very short, very brisk, and we try now to get the three curves of dilution. You'll see immediately that the first curve looks completely different from the second, and that might be related to the fact that there was some warming of the saline in between the two injections. Look what happened now. It's very interesting. I have 22, 9, and, and 14. This has high variability, and that is shown by the yellow uh, square around these measurements. So we're going to repeat, we're going to take the, outli the outlier out, which is a 0 0.22. So we're going to click on top of the 22, please. And then we're going to repeat this injection. Okay. 
And then we'll see the new transit time will come in this 22. And it's 12. And you see now how we have replaced the first value that was an outlier with the new value. And now it's very similar to the other two injections. Very good, Ivac. So I think we can, uh, what do you propose? We have a small chat about the technique or yeah, do you want to go to the next session? I, I think it would be useful to, to get the panel's views on, on some of the things that, that you said. I, I'll, I'll start off, if I may. How accurate or scientific can we be when we replace that outlier? Th that's a very good question. Uh, so the, the way that we see it is that you have seen that if you have uh, a good technique, and I think Diane is going to make an emphasis on how this should be performed, these measurements are very reproducible. You have seen that the first three or four values in REST were almost exactly the same. But you have to also take care that, again, the catheter is in the right position. Sometimes when you're using a jail catheter, for example, and you make an injection, you see how the catheter actually comes back into the aorta. Yeah. And that makes that the bolus of saline, instead of going the three cc's down the vessel, goes a bit to the aorta and another to the coronary, and then you get lower signals and changes in temperature. So I think there is something of technique that is not rocket science, but again, we have to be meticulous, and we're going to have a, a specific uh, uh, set talk about how to be meticulous with technique. But this is the way I see it. Sure. Do you use just the values and see that they're different, or do you actually look at the, the shape the, of the curve as well to choose which one to, to replace? Yeah, that's a good comment, yes. So uh, I think we have to look at both. Uh, the, the, the morphology of the curves in the sense that they should look similar to the, to the previous one or to the next one. And then you know that actually the injection has been done and gone inside the vessel in the same way. And the yellow box is there to help us. It's there to tell us this is a higher variability than expected for this mean transit time. Take a look and replace the one that you think it's, it's the outlier. Thank you. Any, any other comments or questions? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think the hyperemic values are normally uh, uh, more resistant to var for variability. It's uh, mainly the, uh, the baseline values. I think it's all about, uh, well, training, uh, having the whole team involved. Uh, actually, we make it sort of a game. So in our lab, it's a rule that the first time the operator gets three exactly the same values, he has to bring a cake the next day. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that helps. You should bring him a cake if yeah, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then the rest of the team is so if stimulating. I, if I may, one question, which will maybe connect what we just saw to the first case, and that is the question of where to place the wire when you make these measurements. I mean, in the first case that was presented by Sergio, we actually saw that there was, uh, in the territory of the LAD, this hemic defect. So it made a lot of sense to investigate the CMD, whether the CMD exists in that territory. But how about when we have um, unclear test, non-invasive test results, or we do not have them at all? What is it that you do in your, in your cat labs? So concerning the position of the, of, the, of, the, of the sensor, and we have to also be uh, aware that the sensor is placed at the transition of the radio peg segment of the wire. So in that transition, there is the sensor. The sensor should be placed at least six centimeters from the ostium. I think the first studies of, of Bernard de Bruyne and Nico Pels with, with this technique showed that if you are six or nine centimeters from the ostium, you'll have high reproducibility of the measure and probably it's going to have the same uh, value. So this is the, the, the recommendation is this is distant from the ostium. And in terms of which vessel, that's also a really good question. Most of the data out there relate to the LAD. Uh, and the assumption is that the LAD measurement is indicative of uh, dysfunction uh, in, in, or function in all the, the territories. But whether you need slightly different thresholds for each territory, these are all interesting questions which we don't know the answer to. So that, that brings me to the question. Do we, we have a question, yes? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question related to the distance to the uh, pro, uh, distal sensor. Um, so you said it should be at least six centimeters to have a reproducible measurement. For IMR, we know that uh, IMR measurement is, is a transit times between the proximal and the distal part. So it's highly related to the distance. So if you place twice as far, this distal, you, you get a twice as uh, high value of IMR. How can we ensure that the measurements are reprodu reproducible in terms of distance uh, in, the, in the vessel? 
That's a very good question. So when we are in hyperemic conditions, the, the flow that is going to that vessel is huge. So the difference that you will see in mean transit time with two or three centimeters of difference of the sensor, there is almost negligible. Of course, if you put the sensor too distal, let's say the very distal AD, you might have longer transit times. But if you stay to that rule between 10, between 6 and 9, and, and, and nine centimeters from the osseum, you will get pre-reproducible values. I didn't show the position of the wire in my video, but it, Sergio showed pretty well where he placed his, his sensor, and that was the perfect position. And if I could just add a quick point to that, it's really important that the, the sensor stays in exactly the same position between rest and hyperemia. There should be no need to, to move it, but if for any reason the guide catheter falls out or whatever it is, I think you should do the whole set again. It's got to be identical. May I ask a second question? Uh, when, when you make a measurement and you see that the IMR is normal in your patient and you have a normal uh, epicardial vessel, um, is it possible that one other uh, collateral vessel uh, have some uh, microvascular disease but not your main vessel of interest that you, you measured something in? That's a great question, and I'm going to throw it to the panel because uh, we are, we're de debating on that specific point. And the, what Divaga just said is that we select the LAD because it's the vessel with the largest mass. So we think that the problem might be there. But you raise a good point. Let's say that the patient, you have a high suspicion of microvascular disease because of the clinical presentation. Your measurements in the LAD are normal. When, and I start with you, Dian, when do you make the decision, let's go to another territory? Or, or you, what is your approach in this case? Well, it, uh, my approach would be to see the non-invasive test first. Since most of the patients that we see, at least, in, in our cat labs come with a non-invasive test, if the non-invasive test is pointing to a certain location, like it was the case with Sergio, I think that um, um, a lack of uh, CMD in LAD would, for me at least, rule out that diagnosis. And if uh, the test is pointing to another location, like the lateral wall or the inferior wall, then I think I would investigate those arteries as well. Niels, when you decide to go to another vessel, if the LAD is normal? Well, uh, to be honest, we don't do uh, that, so normally we stay, and that also has, to, has a very pragmatic reason, because um, if you're on the left side, then you have to turn to the, to the right coronary artery, you're only adding more and more time to the whole procedure, and it's already a quite elaborate uh, protocol. And as a matter of fact, we have no idea whether, it, I mean, there has been some reports about differences between the different uh, territories, but whether that really relates to regional ischemia, we don't know. There is a question from the audience. Please go ahead. You hear me? Okay. Um, in some cases, I find that the um, transient mean time at baseline is very short. And then after doing the inject the hyperemia, I get uh, even shorter. But let's say I started from uh, 0 0.25 and then go down to 0 0.15. The IMR will be normal, but the CFR will still be low. How, would, how could you interpret this uh, result? Well, <laughs> we, we had that answer prepared. Uh, that's the, the honest. So, so the first thing to make sure is that your measurements are robust. And there's, you know, it's so quick to do that you can measure the whole set a few times, as in two or three sets of resting and three sets of hyperemic, and make sure that your CFR is... Uh, reproducible and it wasn't a measurement artifact. But if you do then do that and find you've got uh, a low CFR but a high resting flow, we used to think that that was just a, a, a limitation of CFR, but now understand that even those patients tend to have abnormal um, uh, perfusion, tend to have abnormal responses to exercise, and we've termed it functional CMD. So. The, these patients tend to have a normal IMR, a normal maximal uh, uh, hyperemic, so minimal hyperemic resistance, but have elevated resting flow. Uh, and even that, it's emerging, is not a normal finding. Can I ask another thing? Um, from my experience, there are a lot of cases in which the non-invasive test is positive and the microvascular evaluation is negative, and vice versa. How, 
from your, I just wanted to ask for your experience if you also encounter this uh, situation. Let me just, so we just uh, finished a trial called UC Clear, where we included only patients with ischemia on non-invasive tests, and we assessed the microcirculation systematically. And we found that 25% of the patients with ischemia and non-invasive tests and normal epicardial vessels have CMD. That means that the other 75% doesn't have CMD, and they have all the reasons. That may include, for example, spasm, if you don't test systematically with acetylcholine, that's something that you should consider. And second of all, there is also the, the, the possibility of a myocardial bridge and other reasons. And we cannot also uh, uh, disconsider the, the fact that sometimes the non-invasive tests can be really false positive. So, uh, to keep the time, I would like to invite uh, Dian Milasinovic to present the next talk about how should I interpret the coronary microcirculation index. Dian? Thank you very much. So, uh, my job was basically to show as uh, this uh, technology is spreading to also um, non expert center in the sense that it's new in those centers that it is still important uh, to keep an eye on the interpretation of uh, the data that we get because of all these questions and uncertainties that we encounter. So basically, uh, what I am going to show you is a case that we recently had and how we interpreted the indices and how it really changed the clinical situation of this patient. So this patient is a 54-year-old uh, lady. It's an, she's a nurse from our hospital, and she really has a typical chest pain on exertion. And she has a non-invasive testing, which was positive. This was an exercise test with ST depressions, as you can see, and it was an incomplete right uh, bundle branch block. Uh, she had chest pain during test as well. And as I said, she's a nurse. So we really trusted that this was a positive test, and we really went into coronary angiography thinking that there would be something uh, on epicardial vessels. However, you see it here, nothing. So what we thought is to proceed with a CMD assessment as the next logical solution, and uh, you will see what, uh, what we got. So basically, when we talk about CMD assessment, and this is throughout the session, what has been mentioned, two indices are really um, the target. And what I want to show you with this slide is that what's in our hands are three variables. So basically, in order to produce IMR and CFR, we impact that. We basically produce the mean transit time. You see it in blue and this is during rest on the baseline, we produce it by injecting saline. Then we induce hyperemia, and once again, we produce these values in green by injecting saline. And at the end of the day, we also have an impact on how uh, the PD measurements are made because we need to be clear and we need to be sure, sure that we equalized at the beginning, that we do not have pressure drifts and so on. So basically we do control these three values at the beginning of the procedure and how the output will be at the end for us and for the patient. So let us uh, see what our patient um, received as an output. So we concentrate on the two values, CFR 1.3 and IMR 26. Nice. So we thought, okay, this explains everything. Chest pain on exertion, young female, a little bit overweight, CMD diagnosed, so we are happy. We have a diagnosis for her. However, if you look closely, let us now see how did we get these values and how we can look at the output every time that we perform this. So I would really advise, especially for, for those who, who just begin with this, is to really look closely beyond just the numbers that we get for CFR and IMR. So this is how they are composed of. You see mean transit time at rest, 0.33, and we divide it by the mean transit time um, during hyperemia, which was 0.27. So this is how we get the CFR, and this is how we get the IMR. We basically multiply the distal coronary pressure by uh, the hyperemic um, mean transit time, and this is how we get the IMR. And this is not where we should stop, because this is all automatic process. And I said in the previous slide, we do control the mean transit time, the curves. So we need to take a look at those as well. So you look now at the Y and X axis. So we see the temperature. Every time we inject the saline, we'll have the temperature drop, and then we'll have the recovery of the temperature over time. And that's on X axis. So let us see now in blue are those curves in rest, at rest, and we see they're fairly at the same place. But let us now look at the orange curves. 
those are the mean transit times that we produced with the injection of saline during hyperemia. So look, this is the first measurement, this is the second measurement, and this is the third measurement. You clearly see that we have variability with the third one. And the console even indicates that with the yellow square that we have there. So can we accept these values now? At last, we look at the FFR value. It's 1.08. So we have pressure drift here as well. So we cannot accept these values as phase values, so we need to repeat our measurements. So what we did, first we checked uh, for the pressure drift. There was no pressure drift anymore after the measurement. And then we look at the values. They are completely different. So we get a CFR of 3.2, and we get an IMR of 17. Now we look once again at the tracings. They look more in line now. So we have a completely new conclusion for our patient, and we actually ruled out CMD in this patient. So what I think are the takeaways when we consider the output it is important that we accurately di diagnose CMD because only then we can have the desired clinical impact. And meticulous assessment is basically the key to correct interpretation because if we are not sure about the data that we got from the output, we cannot put it into the clinical context and make the value that we can out of it for the patient. Dian, that was a, a fantastic demonstration on how this uh, system works. And uh, I have a, a question. When you see this uh, abnormal uh, or this curve that don't look like, like the other curves you just performed, what, what do you do? So you, you take additional measurements and you go again, so practically speaking. Yeah, so what you show in your video, and I think that was very nice, you can just click on the discordant one and repeat. What happened here, and we, 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 were just, you know, we were just thinking what happened, we looked around, is that the IV adenosine was stopped at some point during the measurement. So we were, we were basically not performing under hyperemia. So this was the case, so that's why we repeated everything once again. So basically I think the, the message is, as you showed in your video, if you're sure that you're under hyperemia, if you're sure that your catheter is inside the artery, then I think you just click on the divergent value and you repeat it. But if there is a sort of a systematic error, like, like lack of hyperemia or the catheter is out, maybe it's better to, to repeat it all, all again. So I want to make a comment on the hyperemic agent. Uh, for this case, you mentioned that the IV adenosine was stopped, and that was the reason probably it was not hyperemic anymore, and you got a longer mean transit time. Uh, what we have, uh, actually, we have shifted to papaverin. And uh, papaverin offers you about 40 to 60 seconds of hyperemia that is very, very stable. But the real advantage of, pap of papaverin is that is you put it intracoronary. So you have it in your manifold, you induce hyperemia yourself, so you have complete control of the procedure, and then you perform the measure your measurement actually in a couple of minutes. So you actually shorten the procedure, and I think this could overcome some of the issues related not only to the fact that the pump was stopped, but also sometimes we have unstable hyperemia when you have a, a peripheral infusions of adenosine that can also result in, a, in different mean transit times. Maybe two questions related to that, because I'm not sure how many of our, our participants use papaverin. I would guess that adenosine is more frequently used. And there are two questions that I would have related to the use of papaverin. We used it actually within a, a confines of a research protocol. And what the people, what the colleagues in the cat lab are worried about is the ventricular tachycardia even ventricular fibrillation. So my question to you would be, what are your experiences with that? And then the second question would be, when you try to inject intracoronary, you could get your catheter out sometimes. So do you check for that, or do you just rely on the, on the curves, and if you see that the mean transit time curves are okay, that, then you accept it? So, uh, yes, thank you for the question. It's a very, both questions. So we always check before any injection that the catheter is coaxial with, with the vessel. So that is a part of the technique. And uh, concerning the arrhythmia, so we have a registry in, in ALS and we have 2,500 patients consecutively assessed with uh, papaverin. The incidence of arrhythmias is 0.09%. And, and sometimes this is auto-limited in, in a 
10 seconds and, and they come back to normal. We have uh, shocked patients in 0.05%. So in my view, when you talk about this rate of, of, of complications, it looks pretty low uh, compared to, let's say, to other situations. That's an important, that's an important message, I think. Uh, we've got a question from the audience. Um, Dr. Dimitriadis from uh, Athens, Greece, the University of Athens. We started also our program during the last months using the, the system. So are there any practical tips to ensure that you had hyperemia except from the timing <laughs> and uh, you check for blood pressure or something else, you check for symptoms? There are, I think, some things you want to, to share with us. And also if you do the Aketolin Hollins test, and do you have any issues about it? Any? Yeah. So I can, I can offer yeah, my response and then you'll, you'll hear from the panel. So uh, regarding the acetyl holine, we're not using it yet. We are trying to overcome the problem that it's not um, allowed for cardiology or it has not been. And I, I know that that's the situation in many centers across Europe. So there are uh, ways to, to bridge that gap and I think we can hear some tips and tricks how to do that. And to the second question, uh, we use intracoronary adenosine for most of our FFR measurements that we perform. And there we have a clear response when we give intracoronary adenosine in most of the patients we have bradycardia, so we have a clear response. Uh, with IV adenosine, I must say that in some patients, particularly in, th in this patient, for example, she did not say anything after two minutes. So we just you know, started measuring after two minutes. And then uh, since we repeated measurements after second or a third uh, uh, repeated measurement of IV adenosine, there was a brief bradycardia. So I, I'm not sure that you can rely on the symptoms completely. Sometimes they feel flush, sometimes they feel chest pain, tightness, but I'm not sure that you can rely on it completely with the IV adenosine. So what we do is that we start after two minutes the measurement. Dian, thank you very much. For the sake of time, we're going to move to the next presentation. Professor Neil van Rooyen is going to present a second case uh, also of a patient with post-PCI angina, which is we're well, not so, so frequent, but we face that situation often in clinical practice. Please, Niels. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, so these are my uh, disclosures. Um, so this case is, well, this is not really your typical patient of microvascular disease. First, it's a male patient. Uh, he's 62 years old, and he's a, a crane operator. So this is not, well, the, the few that we have of the, uh, the majority of these patients. And uh, this patient, for the first time in 2015, he was in the uh, cardiology department, and he received actually his first stent into the proximal LAD. Um, but it didn't really help him. So already about half a year later, he returned and he was complaining about uh, 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 continuing angina. Uh, so another angio was performed and it didn't show any abnormalities. Then two years later, again, he received stenting, this time of the mid-LAD. This was uh, performed in, uh, in Eindhoven, so in, uh, in the lab of, uh, of uh, Nico and uh, well, of course, in the, in the temple of FFR, uh, this was an FFR guided uh, PCI. And as you can show, the, the, the FFR was clearly positive at 0.72. And very important, uh, so what they noticed is that the, the, the largest pressure drop was actually over the stenosis in the mid LAD. So uh, they then moved on to uh, perform a, uh, a guideliner uh, assisted uh, stenting of the mid LAD and they got a, a very nice uh, angiographic uh, result in this case. So it seemed that problem was solved, but again, a year later, he returned uh, to the uh, cardiology department with still uh, severe angina, also a positive bicycle test, and again, he was referred to the cat lab. Now this time, uh, uh, the angio looked normal, and uh, of course, FFR was performed, but also the FFR was uh, still within the normal range. Um, so um, he, he went, went, went back home and of course he was still in the control at the outpatient clinic and, and many more tests were to follow. So in 2019, for example, he, he had a SPECT scan uh, not showing any ischemia. And then, then in 2021, again, he was referred to the outpatient clinic, still having the same exercise-related chest pain. Actually, what he said, that there was really not much effect of the previous uh, PCIs, and he was on medication. So he had uh, um, uh, aspirin, he had a calcium channel blocker, and he had uh, statin. 
and uh, then he was uh, uh, referred to the cat lab for uh, um, suspected coronary vasomotor dysfunction and full coronary function testing. Well, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, what we do in, in Nijmegen is we always start with the uh, acetylcholine uh, spasm provocation test. And for that test, I think it is important that if you want to coin that test at positive, it really has to uh, fulfill all the criteria. Um, and those criteria are first that patient needs to have recognizable complaints because that's what he was referred uh, for in the first place. You need to have ischemic uh, changes on the EKG. And then uh, if you have more than 90% uh, angiographic facial constriction, we, um, uh, we call that epicardial spasm. And if only the first two criteria are met, so the recognized well, complaints uh, together with ischemic EKG changes, we refer to that as microvascular spasm, as also has been adopted by the uh, 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 COFADIS uh, working group on this. Um, the, uh, after the uh, acetylcholine provocation testing, we always do the uh, testing for uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction, as has been uh, referred to before. So we also use the, uh, the, the Abbott wire, the bolus thermal dilution, and we use a continuous IV uh, infusion of adenosine, and then we assess CFR and IMR. So let's get back to our crane operator. So. I think this is already interesting. So this is the, uh, the, um, uh, the view of the right coronary artery, and you can appreciate that there is already some uh, facial constriction here. And you have to realize that these patients, when they are referred for coronary function testing, we, um, we ask them to stop all facial active uh, medication, and also uh, we don't give any nitroglycerin. Then uh, uh, at the left side, more or less the, uh, the, the, the same uh, situation. So as you can appreciate, the two coronary stents, so the proximal stent and the stent in the mid-LED, they are nicely open. And then we start with acetylcholine. And we give up to four doses. So we start with a very, very low dose of uh, two microgram. Um, and, but as you can appreciate, uh, especially in the trajectory distal to the, to the stent in the mid-LED, there is already some phase of constriction there, but it's not even close to 90%. But then, after giving 20 micrograms of acetylcholine, you can see very clear uh, phase of uh, constrictive uh, reaction. Um, that's the trajectory behind the stent, but also you see it diffuse, so also the RCX is showing uh, phase of spasm. So this is clearly a positive test for, uh, for, for, for phase of spasm. And luckily, after you give the nitroglycerin, uh, well, everything uh, looks normal again. Uh, so then we continued with the uh, bolus thermal dilution measurements. And uh, I think this is also very important. So always, in these cases, interrogate the epicardial vessels, because we have many, many cases of patients that were referred for a coronary function test, but then they uh, uh, turned out to have uh, a simple epicardial uh, uh, stenosis with a positive FFR. But not in this case. So uh, the stents were well open angiographically, but also hemodynamically, there was no significant uh, pressure loss uh, with an FFR of uh, 0.90. But then the CFR was low, so be below 2.0 at 1.9, and also the IMR uh, was elevated at, uh, at 40 in this case. So in conclusion, this patient had a phasospastic reaction to acetylcholine, but he also had an abnormal uh, reaction on adenosine with a decreased CFR and an increased IMR. So the diagnosis in this case was combined epicardial spasm uh, with also microvascular dysfunction. So um, how did it help us? How did it help the patient? Well, um, uh, we uh, decided to, uh, to change the medication, so to add also a, a long-acting nitrate. And at first, it gave a real uh, improvement of his complaints, uh, which he was, of course, very relieved about. But then, one year later, he still had uh, recurrent chest pain. So I think this illustrates that, well, for the sake of this crane operator, but also for, for many, many more patients, uh, we really have to invest our time and our money 
on well-designed randomized controlled trials on the uh, different pharmacological uh, treatment options uh, that we have available. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Niels. That was a, that was a fantastic case. I just want to be, have three practical questions for you. Sure. The first one is you mentioned briefly on about patient preparation for this type of measurement. Can you please tell us what do you do before the patient comes to the cat lab for this assessment? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, well, first, as I mentioned, uh, they have to be off uh, face of active uh, medication. So that's very important. Uh, but even more important, prepare your patient. So do a very good uh, informed consent, uh, not because there is a risk attached to it. Uh, luckily, it's low, but it's in the same range that you have for a normal uh, coronary angiogram. So do, uh, and, and it's, it's only for diagnostic purposes. It's not as if we're going to give a, uh, a treatment uh, uh, following uh, the coronary function testing. So that's very important. Uh, talk with your patient. Uh, tell everything about the advantages, but also the disadvantages, and, um, uh, and, and also tell them that, that because it is not a very nice uh, <laughs> a test for, 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 for many patients, especially uh, if you give the acetylcholine and sometimes you have complete obstruction, and they, well, they have the pain itself, but it also can induce a lot of fear in these patients. And if you do a good preparation and a good informed consent and you, and, and, and you make sure that they, they come well prepared to the cat lab, then uh, you can really help them by, by either uh, giving them the diagnosis or uh, luckily also in many cases telling them that they don't have a microvascular disease. Great. Second practical point, uh, you, do a, you did a combined assessment of spasm and microcirculation. Yeah. What do you do first, and do you think that is important, in terms of first acetylcholine or first thermodilution? Yeah, well, we, we always uh, start with the acetylcholine testing, and that is for the simple reason that after the acetylcholine testing, you have to give nitroglycerin, in so, some cases even uh, atropine, and uh, that might interfere with your, uh, if, if you would do it uh, the, 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 the other way around, and you would start with your uh, continuous uh, infusion of adenosine and also give nitroglycerin for your, uh, for your CFR and your IMR measurements, then uh, the acetylcholine uh, might end up being uh, false negative. Very good. And now I'm going to raise a third point, which is very difficult to answer and probably goes to Sergio as well. And uh, we have, I don't want to end the session without touching upon treatment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sergio, in, in, in your case, you managed the patient with a high IMR uh, with the beta blockers, and she got better after a period. Is, is that what? Yeah. Now, Niels, you have done more or less the same. You treat the patient with, uh, well, it's a bit more complicated because you have spasm as well. And you put diltiosin, you also put some beta blocker, and the patient did not improve. Is, is that? No, in this case, uh, we didn't give a beta blocker to the patient, but many patients we do. As a matter of fact, it is very empirical medicine. Uh, so every patient is unique, and the reactions are very difficult to predict. And I think there was a very nice presentation uh, by uh, the colleagues from uh, Rome where for all these patients, they make a very detailed timeline. And every change in medication, they do a Seattle angina questionnaire. And that's, I think, well, the only way to sort of get a feeling how the individual patients will react to the different medications. Um, but well, as, um, that's why I ended my speech with a call upon everyone to do well controls, randomized controlled trials, because it is a bit of black box still. Yeah, so what we saw in the case... Just make a short comment. I agree, but the, the, what's different is not now you have a diagnosis. So you did the test and you know what the patient has. Mm -hmm. and that's important both for you and for the patient. Absolutely. He knows what he has. And then sometimes in such, such a complex patient like this one, you just need, just, just need to try different approaches and see the one that works better because, well, it's a very complex patient, actually. I tell you uh, our experience in patients with uh, purely spasm, a normal microvascular function, but uh, calcium antagonists, they solve the problem. Sometimes higher dose, but they solve the problems. Mm. Patients with high EMR and no CFR, beta blockers, they do pretty good. But when you have that combination of microvascular dysfunction and spasm, 
these are really tough. Uh, use your experience as well, Divac. Yeah, absolutely. This, uh, you've given us a really challenging case to, to mm -hmm. make us think. So this is difficult. I mean, I, I would have gone as you did with calcium channel antagonists, given how near occlusive the spasm was, but, uh, but it's difficult. Most of the time, fortunately, you don't get the full house, and you might get, mm. you know, he's had atherosclerosis, epicardial atherosclerosis, vasospasm, and uh, microvascular dysfunction. So in this case, it has to be trial and error. But otherwise, I think we can be guided by the results of the tests that we've, we've found to, to a large extent. And I think that's what we should move towards, to see whether what we find No, I totally agree. Right I, think, I think we really made big progress over the, the last few years. And now that we are able to, to, to really discriminate between the different endotypes, now the next step if, is, of course, to find out which uh, treatment will do best at the, for which endotypes. And so I think that's where we stand now as the community. Maybe one just comment. We have a lot of post-PCI angina patients. And we know from various studies that it's going to be in the range of 20 to 30%. And we've been telling, or some of our colleagues have been telling to these patients, you feel nothing, we stented it, we ended your uh, treatment, so you may have some psychological issues, so we neglected this fact. And I think that with this uh, case that you show, we really can do something more than that. We really can get those patients back to the cat lab and investigate the microcirculation and vasomotor function and then see maybe that these symptoms are not correlated with the epicardium atherosclerosis, but have other issues and other causes, and that we can at least inform the patients why, have, why they have symptoms. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree there, and it would be very naive to think that by just putting one stand that you will solve the systematic disease that most of these patients have. That was very nice in the, the case that Sergio showed us. So there was a patient with diabetes, with hypercholesterolemia. So I think it's very important that we realize that it's also a continuum of endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerotic disease, and we have to treat aggressively risk factors, um, and, and we also have to realize that, that just solving one problem not always is solving the, uh, the complete picture for that patient. Niels, thank you. Thank you very much. We've gone through a, through a lot of stuff from technique to, to uh, interpreting results, and I think it would be helpful if we draw it all together. So, Carlos, thank you very much for doing that for us to conclude. Great. Thank you. Uh, Divaga. So I think it has been a fantastic session. I have learned a lot, and, and the way to learn about CMD is, is case-based. We learn but with every case that we treat. So in the first part of the presentation, we learned from, from Sergio that actually when a patient is coming with ischemia to the cat lab, the patient has non-obstructive coronary artery disease, is the time to say, okay, open a pressure wire, not to measure the pressure, but actually to measure the temperature, to assess the coronary microcirculation. And don't forget that one in four patients with normal coronaries and ischemia will have uh, CMD. We learn from Dian that technique is important, and technique is important from the position of the catheter, the way we make the injections, but also know how to interpret the waveform, the temperature curve that we're seeing, and knowing when one of this is abnormal in order to have appropriate results. And from Niels, we learn that when a patient comes with post PCA angina, these are tough patients. I learned from you, Niels, that always start with FFR. These are patients with epicardial disease. We have to be sure that the FFR is normal and then jump to the microcirculation. So in a nutshell, we have understood the importance of assessing the microcirculation in patients with non obstructive coronary artery disease. We have seen very uh, clearly that diagnosing CMD is feasible and can be easily integrated into the daily workflow. And finally, that when we identify the endotype of that particular patient, tailored medical therapy becomes easy, and this has been associated with improvement in quality of life. Thank you very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of the meeting.